Hi, I'm Alistair, I'm a games designer, and in this video I'd like to teach you how you can make this electronic puzzle game, which you might find in an escape room, for example. So how the game works is like this. You can see at the top of the board here, I've got a series of LED pulses being generated uh, every five seconds. And these pulses come in different colours and they're different lengths. And they work their way downwards through this sequence of LED strips. Now, every now and again they get to a junction, and at each of those junctions I've got a toggle switch. Now, depending on how players move that toggle switch, it will direct the LED pulses onto different segments of the track. Uh, now, at the bottom of the board here, you'll see that at the end of each track segment, I've got these uh, slightly abstract icons that are meant to represent different elements. So I've got a fire, a leaf, lightning, sunshine and a water droplet. And each of those is associated with the colour of one of these LED pulses. So what players are meant to do is they're meant to direct the correct coloured pulses to the matching uh, element symbols. Uh, so for example here I've got a green series coming down so I'm going to send that to the leaf. Uh, here I've got a red which I'm going to send to the fire the white I'm going to send to the lightning and as I correctly send them down the right segments what you should see is that uh, you kind of have a, a meter at the bottom of each track which gets built up to show uh, the number of successful LEDs that have been sent that way these sort of little LED particles and the object of the game is for players to correctly send three matching LEDs of the correct colour uh, down each of the track segments uh, so I'm now going to attempt to do that. And you'll see, uh, when the puzzle is complete, I've just got a, a chase sequence now, which is lighting up all the LEDs. And at this point, you could also have the Arduino uh, trigger a relay to unlock a maglock or trigger some other electronic device and let the players proceed in the room to the next puzzle. So let me talk a bit more about how this is set up. Like I said, I've got an Arduino at the top here. I'm using a Nano, but you could really use um, any Arduino or other microprocessor that's capable of driving these kind of LED strips. This is a WS2812 LED strip, commonly known as NeoPixels. They're very popular and cheap on the internet. And they are what's referred to as programmable LEDs. So um, you supply a five volt and a ground line, and they also have a single data line running through them. And depending on uh, the value that's sent by that data, um, you can program each one individually to light a different RGB value. I'm using a library called FastLED, which makes the programming of that pretty straightforward. Now, there's lots of examples of using these kind of LED strips and the FastLED library on the internet. But in all the examples I could find, they were about using a series of LEDs in a single continuous line. Um, I haven't really seen anything that showed a branching network of LEDs like this one. Although I have to be honest, I am kind of using a little bit of a, a con trick here because this is still a single series of LEDs. It's just I've arranged it in such a way that it looks like a branching path. So what's actually happening here? Here I've got LED 0, which is the first one connected to the Arduino uh, through a, a little series resistor in this capacitor here. And then what happens is my data line comes down here and then I go across this strip here, down here, towards the water icon and then I go up and back around all the way to the lightning bolt, uh, up here to the sunshine, then I go up this strip here, up to the top, around and down again, finally ending up at this little LED here. So I've got LED 0 all the way to LED, this is LED 92 are actually all laid out in a single line. And when I, uh, in the Arduino code, which I'll show you in a moment, when I want to address one of these particular LEDs, I refer to it by that position in the line. Um, now you see some of these lines were actually going back up towards the Arduino, and some of them are coming down. So uh, in order to make an LED travel this way, sometimes I'm gonna be increasing the LED number in the strip, and actually sometimes I'm decreasing it. But all that's handled uh, in the code. 
by the time you're looking at the screen, it kind of looks like a branching path. Especially, obviously, if you were building a real prop out of this, you would hide uh, these wires here. A um, couple of other things to note. So, as well as 5 volt and ground going at the top here, I've also got an additional 5 volt and ground coming in, kind of midway through the series. Uh, what you'll find is that um, where you have a 5 volt power supply like this, which is uh, extended over a long series of LEDs in a line, the voltage is going to drop over that distance. So, in order to make sure that I've got um, you know, a decent 5 volt supply all the way through to my last LED here, I actually have an additional injection of 5 volts midway through the LED strip, so that's coming in here at the side. Um, I've also got a capacitor on the power line and I've got a series resistor uh, going to the Arduino as well, which is best practice whenever you use these kind of strips. Uh, the toggle switches themselves, well they are just uh, going to GPIO input pins on the Arduino, so each of these is just being uh, read as an input. If you wanted to, again, you could have a, a three-way rotary switch, for example, maybe instead of a, a toggle switch here, uh, or you could have a push button or a, some sort of big uh, like slide lever or something like that. There's lots of options here, but it's an input which, when this LED is lit by a uh, particle, it determines which track it's going to jump onto next. Um, this is my power supply. It's worth noting that uh, an LED strip like this, each LED is sort of uh, three LEDs in one even because it has a red, green and a blue component. Now, suppose that each of those draws, I don't know, 40 milliamps at full brightness. Now, when you have this showing white, you're actually uh, drawing a surprising amount of current. If you're lighting all of the LEDs on this strip up, uh, you've got, uh, you need to have a power supply that's able to supply enough amps to do that. So this is a 5 volt, 40 amp power supply. Um, that's plenty and that's also uh, supplying the Arduino at the top as well. Um, but you do need to calculate how big a power supply you'll need based on how many LEDs you've got in total and also how many are likely to be lit at one time. And here's a Fritzing model. This is exactly the same circuit as you were just looking at on the board behind me. Um, it's just it's a bit easier to show you some of the smaller details up close on a model like this. So, um, just to reiterate really, these NeoPixels are all in a single continuous strip that goes around like this. Um, when you buy uh, NeoPixel strips, they typically come on a reel and uh, you get kind of reels in length of, of meter long sections and then you can connect them. But it's possible to break uh, that strip up, those uh, copper contacts, and if you just take a regular pair of scissors and snip across the contacts, um, you can then rearrange any of the sections and join them back up again. Uh, so long as you connect the ground lines together, the 5 volt lines together, and you take the data out from one LED to the data in of the next, and then you can reposition them however you want. So that's uh, what I've done on the board here. Um, you'll see the arrows on the strips here, again just indicating the uh, direction which is going. It's very important to always feed data into the data inside and obviously take it out from the data outside to the next one in the series as well. Um, I mentioned that uh, at the start of the spouse pie I've got a capacitor. So uh, this is a 10 volt, 1000 uh, microamp capacitor. Um, and I've also got another one over this side here. Anything greater than about 6.3 volts and uh, yeah, 1000 microfarads, that would be about the right amount there. That's just so that when um, sort of when LEDs first light up and there's sort of a, a, a sudden current inrush into that LED strip, that's what this uh, capacitor will help to just buffer power to supply that. So this, um, you know, you're not suddenly trying to draw a lot of uh, power from, from which might brown out the Arduino or something like that. Uh, so um, that's what the capacitor is doing. This very first data in line, so this is my first LED at the beginning of the strip. I've got that connected to um, the A0 pin actually. Um, that's just happened to be on the correct side of the board for the way I've got it laid out. But you can really use um, any GPIO pin you want. So one of the digital inputs or one of the analog inputs on this side will be fine. We're going to use it as an output. And then it goes through a 330 ohm resistor before going into the first uh, input of the first LED like that. Um, 
Like I say, I've got my toggle switches. I'm using these uh, sort of nice, chunky missile switch types. Uh, they all have one side connected to a common ground. So that's this black line here. That's all going to ground here. I should also mention that the ground of the power supplies and the ground of the LEDs is all uh, connected as well. So we've all got a single ground, everything connected. The other side of the toggle switches then uh, is going... So this switch here, this first one, is going to pin 2. And then I've got a switch down the bottom here. And if we follow that yellow line up, it comes in. That goes to pin 3. And then I've got 4 and 5 are going to this switch and this switch, respectively. Uh, and that's it for the wiring. OK, and here's the Arduino code. And this is really where the magic happens. So there's quite a lot of code here. Um, like I say, all of this will be available to download from my Patreon account, uh, but I will step through every line of code here as well. So if you just want to, um, you know, copy down the code yourself, that's fine. I will explain how it all works. So just in the comments at the beginning here, um, once again, I've laid out how my strips are connected. So the numbers in brackets here, this represents the actual uh, sequential position of the LEDs on the strip. I've also laid out where the uh, switches that enable you to toggle between the different tracks are going to be positioned. And across the top here I've got this thing called distance travelled. So um, although I've got a total of 92 LEDs here in my strip, um, a given particle is never going to travel all of them because the longest track is actually this one here, track 4, which only goes um, 37 steps long. So it's actually uh, a particle travelling down that track will traverse through a series of 37 LEDs and those LEDs will be uh, these ones in order. But you'll see that even then it does some weird jumping. It goes from 0 to 6, well that's fine, and then it goes from 12 to 19 and then misses out a few, and then we do 25 uh, all the way through to 47. But if we go down some of the other tracks, we'll notice here we go, so they all begin from 0 to 6, every track begins at the same uh, starting point. But then we go backwards from 11 to 7, and then up to 63, so it's a little bit complicated. And this information is actually arranged uh, a bit lower down in some arrays here. But um, I'll, I'll get onto those in due course. I just wanted to explain this diagram. Um, if you want to create this puzzle yourself and to create your own uh, kind of variation, you know, you can have as many different branching segments as you want and you can have as many different LEDs in a, in a segment. Um, I think you'd find it really helpful to lay out your setup in, in a, uh, some sort of similar design to this to start with. Just make a note of... Uh, the which LED you're up to and how they're connected together because you'll find that really helpful when you get to the code later on. Okay, so going through here we've got uh, a library, so we included, like I say, the fast LED library. You can download that from this GitHub link here. It's a really great library. It's very rock solid. It will allow you to use lots of different sorts of LED strips, uh, different chipsets, uh, different byte ordings. It's a really, really good program. So we're including that, and that's going to make it easier to address the LEDs on our strips. We'll define a couple of uh, sort of things here. So we've got the total number of LEDs, that's 93. And also, as I mentioned, no uh, particle is actually going to traverse all 93 of them, though. So we'll define the maximum number of LEDs per track as 40. Now, that's actually a little bit over the top. The, the maximum is 37, but we're going to use this to define... Uh, the size of the array. So I just want to have a couple of extra values at the end to sort of, um, a little bit like if you imagine a train line coming into a station and you kind of get the, the buffers at the end to stop the train going any further. We're going to store all of the LED series in order and then we're going to have our little buffers at the end of the line. Uh, those are going to be minus one values to let us know that we get there. Um, and then I define a strut. Now I don't no, I can't remember if I've used one of these before in one of these uh, example projects here. Generally speaking, when you uh, store variables in code, you'll be aware that you have different sorts of uh, data types you can use. So if you're storing an integer value, you might store an int like this. 
If you're small, uh, storing a small value that can be uh, less than 256 values, you can store it in a byte. And then you also have um, Boolean values, which are true or false. Now, for our particles that are moving down the LED strips, we've actually got a whole bunch of different properties about those particles that we want to store. Uh, we want to know uh, where it is on the strip, so position, how fast it's moving, how long it is, uh, what track it's currently on, and also what type of particle it is. That is, is it um, a, you know, a red, a yellow, a blue? Is it meant to end up at the fire or the sunshine or the water droplet symbol? Um, so a struct is um, it's a little bit like an, an object, and it's a way of grouping a lot of variables together into a single uh, structure, that you can then use to re describe uh, several related characteristics of the same thing. So every time we talk about a particle, so if we make an array of particles in the future, every member of that array is going to have all of these properties associated with it. And so when we talk about a particle, we can talk about its type, its position, its speed. It's a way of kind of grouping variables together. Um, that's probably all I, I'll say about that, so just so you know. So we're going to call that a particle. We then get on to the constants. So these are uh, values which are not going to change throughout the life of the code. We are using four switch pins, and these are the GPIO pins, which I just showed you in the wiring diagram. That's where they're connected to. Now, um, we're defining a maximum number of particles that can be on the board at the same time. And the reason for that is that we're actually going to use um, something called a pooling mechanism. So rather than creating a brand new particle uh, like this every time a new one is spawned at the top, what we're actually going to do is we're going to be recycling a pool of particles. When one hits the bottom, we're going to change this alive variable here to say, OK, this particle is no longer alive, so it's not going to move, it's not going to light up the display anymore. And when we next want to spawn a particle, uh, effectively what we can do is we can we can rebirth a, a previous particle that's hit the bottom. We can bring it back up to the top again, change its colour and its speed and its length if we have to. And this way of reusing particles is a, a very efficient way of keeping your memory usage down. So when you're writing for small processes like Arduinos, it's actually quite wasteful if you keep on creating new particles at the top and we keep on destroying them at the bottom. Uh, that's very inefficient when you've only got a very small amount of memory to work with. A much better way of doing it is to define a certain, uh, like I say, pool of particles is how they're described normally. Uh, and we're going to have 10 particles in that pool. And uh, when one hits the bottom, rather than actually destroying it, we're just going to kind of set this flag to say, OK, this particle's no longer alive. It's not going to take an active role anymore in the gameplay. But next time we want to spawn a particle at the top, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, resurrect one of these um, kind of dead particles in the pool and bring it back to the top again. So uh, this match particles here is going to, to describe the number of particles that we are allowed to have uh, revived and alive at the same time. The rate counter here, uh, this is a variable that describes how often new particles are going to be respawned at the top of the screen. So depending on how long your uh, chain of LEDs is, you know, you can make one of these room scale if you wanted to and have, you know, 20 different switches and each one goes through a length of 100 LEDs. If you do that, uh, you're probably going to want to slow down the rate at which they're spawned as well. Um, either that or you're going to need to increase your maximum particles count because uh, if you keep on spawning them at that rate and you have a very long track, they're not going to be reaching the end and they're not going to um, be able to be reused for new ones being born again. Um, now, I've got a number of different particle types. So in this example here, I've got one particle type for each uh, track ending. So we've got five types of particles. And these are the five colours they are. That's because I've got those five elements. And we've also got five tracks that they go down. There's actually no reason why that has to be the case. You can have, um, you know, multiple types of particles that could all potentially go to the same ending. Uh, or you could have some particles that don't have an ending to go to and they kind of just fall off the side of the track sometimes. But I think 
the most straightforward um, mechanism in terms of a gameplay mechanic is to is to have the same number of types of particle as there are tracks and then each one has its own unique ending that it has to be sent to i think that's the thing that players will most instinctively understand what they have to do and in an escape room game that's particularly important because you probably need them to discover what the rules of the game are um, themselves you don't want to have to explain to players what to do you want them to find out uh, by trial and error okay now we come to this array which i mentioned at the top so um, this is an array that has five rows and each of those rows represents uh, one of the possible tracks um, through the network of strips this is the left hand side at the top and i'm moving now to the right hand side so i'm going to refer to this one as track zero uh, and then we have track one track two track three and track four um, and you'll see that the numbers here correspond to the numbers i had at the top here in terms of this is the position of each LED in the sequence. So all this array does is this describes that diagram I have at the top. When we get to the end of track, this is what I was referring to as that um, buffer area. So each of these has to be the same length. In an array, all of the elements have to be the same length, uh, which is why we've defined this maximum number of LEDs per track to be slightly longer than the longest track. So it's 40 long. And when you get to the, the final LED of, of any particular track, all you do is insert minus ones as kind of padding for the rest of the uh, array. There's other data structures I could have used here that um, arguably would be a little bit more efficient because in a sense, I've got some wasted data here just having to repeat the minus ones each time. But uh, the trade-off for that is I think this is the easiest way to represent and to understand uh, what's going on in this structure here. So for the sake of a handful of repeated minus ones, I think this is probably the best uh, structure I could use. We've then got another uh, array below this as well. So this is the uh, score counter. So at the bottom of each track, the final three LEDs, they're the ones that are gonna kind of fill up as particles reach the end of each track. So you'll see here that um, the final three LEDs in this track, 84, 85, and 86, and I'm listing them here in the reverse order um, because I want to build up from the bottom upwards. So we've got 87, 88, 89 here, and here we've got 89, 88, 87. So again, uh, this is just the final, the final three LEDs. If you wanted to, again, there's no particular reason this has to be three, that's an arbitrary amount that I just sort of chose. Um, you could make it so there's just a single single LED at the bottom or you can make it have to be 10 or you could make something else light up but that's just uh, what I chose is I think a fairly um, obvious indicator of, of what the player's meant to do. Okay so that's it for the constants then we move on to the global section so these are variables which are going to change throughout the game. So we're going to keep track of our score so um, we have a score for each particle type. So again, this is an array. We've got five particle types. We know that. And the score for each of them is initialized at least at zero. Um, we then have an array of this CRGB object. So this is something that is defined in the fast LED library. And that uh, describes the color that each LED is going to be. So this is an array that has one element in it for every LED that we have on the board uh, and each of those elements it has RGB components. We'll keep track of when the last time we created a, a particle was at the top of the screen that will let us know that it's time to create one again and we also initially actually create our particle pool. So uh, this is the structure that we defined at the top so that particle and we're going to create an array of those particles. It's going to have the maximum particles in it. So it's going to have 10 of these particle objects. We're going to call that particle pool. This is a little bit more complex than some of the coding styles I've used in, in earlier projects. So um, if you're keeping up, good job. Um, you know, some of these are slightly more advanced concepts. This thing about um, 
pooling, memory usage, and about structs and things like that. And I've got some multi-dimensional arrays. So this is a little bit more advanced, um, but uh, you know, I've tried to make the comments as clear as I can and do ask if you have any questions as well. Okay, then we get to uh, setup functions. This will be familiar. Uh, this is what happens when the code first starts to run or every time it's uh, reset. We'll create a serial connection. That's not actually required. Uh, that's just what I use to output some debugging information to the USB connection. Uh, this is the function in the fast LED library that actually uh, kind of initializes the LED strip. So we'll call add LEDs. We'll say what sort of LEDs are we using? So like I say, I'm using WS2812, um, which are also known as NeoPixels. This is the pin on the Arduino, which is connected to that first data in on the first LED. And this is the uh, color byte ordering. So um, you're probably familiar with RGB values, and I mentioned RGB earlier. Um, the strip I'm using actually lists the byte orders in a different uh, order. So you get the green byte, then the red byte, then the blue byte. Uh, so this is GRB. If you find yourself using the fast LED library, and you know what you're expecting to be a, a red LED light up blue, for example, then it's always worth checking your um, byte ordering there because it's sometimes a bit surprising. Um, and we'll pass it the uh, array of LEDs that we defined, and this is the total number of LEDs that we defined at the top of the code. So that's just a standard initialization code for this library. Um, up here, we uh, declared our, um, or we defined our particle pool. Now we actually need to put some objects in it. So we'll just fill the particle pool with new particles. Um, again, we'll initialize them all to the default values of just no speed, no position. Uh, they're not any length or anything, and they're currently not alive. Um, we define all the input pins as input pull-ups so that when we switch them across and we make a connection to ground, we'll be able to read that as a low signal. And finally, um, now, I don't know, again, if I used any random values in any of my previous code. Uh, so the Arduino library has a random function in it, but uh, something that always surprises people that haven't used it before is that if you call the random function in your code, normally you'll get the same series of outputs coming up each time in the same order. And you sort of think, well, that's not very random. Random functions require a seed value, uh, which is uh, like the sort of where the algorithm starts from. And this is a really uh, useful way of setting a, a random seed is to take a reading of one of the unconnected Arduino analog inputs. So I haven't got anything plugged into uh, A5 at all. So if I do a reading of that, what I'm going to pick up is just sort of a background fluctuations in um, sort of capacitance or resistance in, in whatever surface I'm around and things like that. And if my finger happens to be near it or if a wire is close by, I'm going to get slightly different changes of values. And by using that reading as a random seed, it will ensure that I do get at least uh, fairly good pseudo random results each time the code is run. So that's just a, a little tip there about if you ever want to do anything randomly. Um, set LEDs, I'm going to come back to that one I think in a moment. That is the function that actually works out which LEDs to light given a particular particle, but I'm going to come back to that. Uh, spawn particle, this one's pretty straightforward. Um, so this is what we call every time uh, that value of this rate value here. So if 5,000 milliseconds have passed since the last time a particle was spawned, we're going to call this spawn particle. That's going to loop over all of the particles in the pool and it's going to find the first one that is not alive. So remember this is a particle that either has never existed so far in this game, or alternatively it did exist once in the past, it made it all the way to the bottom at which point it was kind of made inactive and waited to be uh, respawned again. So we'll take that particle from the pool and what we'll do is we'll reset it back to the top again. So we'll make its position zero, we'll give it a speed. Um, if you wanted to, you could randomize the speed here as well. I've just set them all to be one to start with. Uh, we'll rebrand the particle as a new type. So uh, whatever type it was before. And uh, I will always make it so that its length is 
uh, one more than whatever its type is. So um, I'll describe this in a bit more detail later, but this is to do with um, accessibility. If the only way that I had to distinguish between my different types of particles was their colour, that wouldn't be an accessible puzzle for anyone that was colourblind. So I also want to make sure that every type of particle is a different length. And so the particles that are meant to go on the leftmost track, well, they're only uh, one LED uh, long. And then the next one along, well, that's going to be two LEDs long. And then the ones right over the right-hand side, well, they are five LEDs long, so they're much longer particle chains. Um, but I'll, I'll come on to that again a bit later. Uh, I'm going to initialize everything onto the, the first track in the array. That doesn't really matter because that's going to be changed as soon as they hit the first uh, junction point anyway. And I will now say that this particle is back alive again. So I've taken a, a dead particle from the pool, I've re-skinned it, I've reset all its parameters, and I've made it alive and I've put it back at the top again. Uh, this is my unsol uh, unsolved method, sorry, not unsolved. Uh, this is what's called when the puzzle is correct, so when all three of the meters are uh, up to their limit, so when they've all got three particles successfully in them. Uh, so all I've got at the moment, this is basically lifted off one of the fast LED example functions. This is what makes that pretty kind of rainbow pattern. But you could put anything you wanted in this bit here. Uh, this is where you'd send your signal to a relay to activate it or to you know display a, a value on an LED or, or whatever it is you want to do. This is the method where you'd write that in as to what the reward that the players get is for actually correctly solving the puzzle. Okay, so, well done, you're still with me. We're going to go on to the loop function. This is the last uh, function in the code. So I'm just going to go through this and then I need to go back to one that I missed out. So what we're going to do first of all, I'm just going to, for the purposes of debugging, uh, and you, if you're anything like me, you'll find that you probably will need to debug this code at least once because uh, it can be get a bit tricky to make sure that you're counting the right number of LEDs and things like that. So I'm just going to uh, print... On the Arduino serial monitor, I'm going to print what the uh, values of how each of those toggle switches have been set. So whether they're pointing to the left or the right, and that's going to help me know which track the LEDs are meant to be going on to. Uh, we'll clear the LEDs, so we'll completely redraw the state of the uh, board on every loop through. We'll work out what the current time is. And... If the current time is more than whatever the last time was when we spawned um, a particle added to the rate, so if we're more than the rate beyond the last spawn time, well, that means that it's time to spawn a new particle. So we'll call that spawn particle method, which I, I mentioned above, and we'll also just uh, update our count and say, okay, well, this is now the last time we spawned it. Um, then what we'll need to do is we need to go through and actually move all of the particles through the network. So that's what this section does here. So we're going to loop over uh, all of the particles that can possibly be active at the moment. But then we're only going to look at those ones that really are alive right now to start with. So this section here, this is all about dealing with the switch points. So the points on the track at which this particle can be moved between the different tracks, okay? So um, what we're going to do, so the first place, the first junction is located after six LEDs down the track. So that's where this number six is coming from. And if I go back up to the top, just to prove this, so we are here and the distance travelled at this point is 6, OK? And we've reached our first switch. The reason why I'm doing um, distance or position divided by 16, rather, so this is a, a little bit complicated. In the original version of the code that I had here, I just had the position equal to the number of LEDs that uh, a particle had moved down. And that was fine, and that made the code here a bit simpler because I didn't need this bit here. But what that meant is that the LEDs kind of very abruptly jumped down the track. So you have, you know, a, a single LED would be lit at position one, 
and then it would go off and a single LED would be lit at position 2 and it would be very kind of jerky movement and I wanted to smooth that movement out somehow. So uh, what I'm doing is effectively sub pixel brightnesses rather than uh, go from an LED at full brightness to the next LED at full brightness. I'm fading uh, an LED that's currently occupied down and then I'm fading the new kind of head of the particle up at the same time and I'm doing that in sixteenths of an LED. So that's where this uh, this 16 number comes from. Again, that's uh, that's kind of quite an advanced um, detail I'm doing there, so don't worry too much if that doesn't take it in. What you need to know is that um, this creates a smoother looking movement of the particles. That's why I've, I've done it. And it also means that this position member here, uh, the position which is a member of the struct at the top here, this is not actually equal to the number of LEDs uh, traversed, it's 16 times uh, the distance of one LED traversed. So everything I'm doing kind of 16 times magnification uh, and that means that I can get a smoother movement. So if, um, if the particle or if a particle has reached this position, so it's reached LED number six, what we then need to do is decide which track it's going to jump onto next. We'll do that by reading the uh, first switch in the array, so we define switch pins as the array to which all the switches are connected, we'll read that switch and then we'll set the track of our particle to either track 0 or track 3. So once again coming back up to the top here, I apologise for having to scroll up and down all the time but um, hopefully you'll see why. So at this switch here we're either going to send it this way or we're going to send it this way. Now if we send it this way we don't know yet whether it's going to end up here or here or here but it's definitely going to be one of them so for now what we'll do is we'll just put it onto track zero which is the bottom if we send it this way we're not going to know whether it's going to end up here or here until we get to this switch but for now we'll just pick track three because that's definitely in this direction so at this point here this is the switch we've reached at the moment Depending on the value of this switch, we're either going to say, OK, this particle, let's move it onto track 0, or let's move it onto track 3. OK? Uh, so that is what this bit here means. OK, now let's look at the next switch. So the next switch is coming up here. So this only applies if we uh, went left at the first junction. So at that point, our track now is... Uh, less than 2 because we're either on track 0 or track 1 and if that's the case the next time we come across a junction is at distance 13 so once again let's go back up here so we're at distance 13 and we've gone either track 0 or track 1 so we've reached this point here this is our next switch and at this point we can either go here this will definitely end up on track 0 or we can go here, and this will either end up on track 1 or track 2. We don't know yet. So again, what we'll do here is we'll say, OK, so at uh, position 13, uh, depending on the value of switch 1, we'll either send things onto track 0, or for now, we'll send it onto track 1 of these two to send it down this path. And so that is what this code here does. OK, now let's suppose that we went uh, the other way at the top instead. So this is if we went right at the first junction. Uh, so that means that we decided to put it on track 3 at this point. Uh, so we, we're going down this path here. So if we went on to track 3, we come across the next junction after 14 LEDs. Da, 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 da. That is here. So after 14 LEDs, we've reached this edge. And now this is a, a definite outcome here. So depending on the value of this switch, we definitely either end up on track three or we end up on track four. Those are the only two options at this point. So that's actually nice and straightforward. Um, we will send this one to track three or four. And we've got one last switch left. And this is if we went left at the first junction and then right, 
we had uh, one final choice to make and that happens at the 24th position so that is here so we went left at this one then we went right and we got here so at this point we can either end up on track one or on track two and sure enough that is what we have written in this line of code here so these are you know a little bit tricky to understand exactly what's going on there and that's why i said i really do recommend you write down uh, that array at the top that shows where all your leds are how they connect to each other what position they are in but all it's saying really is that um for any led that reaches a junction and the way we identify that it reaches a junction is we work out what track it's on and how many uh, LEDs down that track it is, which we do by dividing the position by 16. Um, so that's, that's how far down the track it is. This is what track it's on. Then what we do is we decide what track it's going to jump onto next. And because uh, the tracks at the top here overlapped like this, we can jump here from track zero to track one, let's say, and it's not like uh, you will notice any difference in the LEDs being lit at all because um, we've jumped between two tracks, but they completely overlap at this point. So um, it's fine. You know, you won't notice that, uh, that happening. OK, phew. So that was all about uh, junctions and moving across. What we'll now do is, having decided what track each particle is on, well, we'll simply move it down the track. So we increase the position by whatever the... Uh, speed is of this particular particle. That's nice and easy. The next thing we need to do is we need to consider the case of, okay, well what happens when it gets to the end of the track that it's on? So for this we go back to that fact which I said at the top which is that the array that records uh, the LED positions always ends in minus one. That was that buffer that we get to at the end of the race. So when we're about to run off the edge of the track what happens is we hit a minus one value. So what we'll do is we'll actually look into that LED track array. Uh, we'll look into the track we're on and the position down that track we are. And if we find that the position that we're in on the track we're on is minus one, or alternatively, if we find out that we're actually somehow, I mean, this should never happen, but just as a double check, let's see if we've managed to try to get to a position that's greater than the the number of LEDs uh, in total that we have. Well, in either of those two cases, we want to kill this particle because it's got to the end of the track. Let's remove it from the game field. So we'll set its alive property to false. And remember, if this is false, the next time we come round, this whole section here won't get executed because this only applies for alive particles, okay? So uh, we'll set it to false. And then what we need to do is to work out how we score this particle. So if the type of this particle matches the track it's on, and if we have currently got less than a score of three for this track, then let's increase the score by one. Alternatively, if we've ended on the wrong track, so if the type of this particle doesn't match the track we're on, uh, and also if we have got at least one score already on this track, then we'll actually subtract one from the score. I'm not sure I actually showed this in the example, but uh, let's say you've got um, three white LEDs successfully queued up at the bottom of the white track. If you then sent a red LED down that track, for example, what it would actually do is it would reduce the number of white LEDs by one. Uh, that's what this line here does. Um, again, if you didn't want any action to happen, you could simply comment this line out uh, and it would have no effect sending uh, incorrect values there. It would just be a matter of, of the total amount of correct values you'd sent would be your score. Uh, but that's the behaviour I've got at the moment. Um, and then once we've done all that, so we've accounted for moving positions on the tracks, we've accounted for getting to the end of the track, now we need to actually draw the particles itself. And for this we go back to that set LEDs method, which I kind of skipped over earlier. So let's go back up there. So this uh, LEDs method deals with this uh, fading in and out, this smooth kind of anti-aliasing or, or sub-pixel 
uh, movement which I was describing. So again, this is a, a little bit complicated. Um, you know, if you want to just gloss over this, that's absolutely fine. But I'll step through what's going on here. So the first thing we do is that um, I'm actually going to take the colour of this type of particle. So that was defined at the top of the code here. Uh, we had red, green, yellow, blue and white as our main types of colour. Obviously you can replace those with whatever you want. And I'm going to convert that to an HSV value instead. So rather than RGB, I'm going to have a hue, a saturation and a brightness. And the reason for that is because I want to be able to fade the uh, particle out at the end and fade it in at the, the tip, but without changing the hue at all. So with RGB values, it's quite hard to kind of fade a red out without sort of changing the quality of the red as well so it's much easier to do when you're dealing with hsv values so that's what we're going to do here so i'm going to uh, make a temporary color uh, which is an hsv based on the color of this type of uh, particle and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to work out what fractional are we uh, what fraction of the leading led have we moved into so all the time up to now i've been looking at this position divided by 16 variable. That's going to give me a whole number. But if I do the modulo here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get uh, effectively the sort of the leftover. I'm going to get how much have I advanced into the next LED. And it, it's going to give me as a, as a 16th um, this frac value here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, light up basically as I advance into the next LED, I'm going to light it up in sixteenths. So um, the first uh, LED that is lit by this particle, so I'm going to loop over uh, for as long as this particle is long, so if I'm dealing with a, a particle that is five units long, I'm going to loop over this five times and I'm going to take this fractional value and I'm going to multiply it by 16 because if I've got 16 sixteenths, let's say, I want to uh, have a fully lit uh, pixel at the front, fully lit LED pixel at the front. If I'm only uh, 1 16th in, I want to light 16 out of 255, obviously. So we're going to light the first pixel by whatever the fractional proportion is we're into that first thing. Uh, the last pixel is going to be whatever the kind of inverse of that is. So by definition, if we've extended the head of the particle um, let's say halfway into the next pixel, then the back one should be reduced by halfway as well because it's kind of advanced slightly. So we're going to subtract uh, the value that we had in our first one. We're going to subtract that from 255. 255 is maximum brightness. Um, so we'll subtract that fraction from that and we'll get the leftovers. And all of the values in the middle are always going to be constant brightness. So uh, this is really, this is a lot to take in, so I, I, I do apologise if this is, um, you know, taking a long time to get through, but I'm trying to explain it the best I can. But for every pixel occupied by this particle, it's either a middle pixel, in which case it's at full brightness anyway, it's the very leading pixel, in which case it's going to be lit up by the fraction that we have advanced into that uh, LED, or certainly it's going to be the very tail end one and that's just going to be uh, the complement of this one. Having done all those sums there's just a few little things we need to be careful of because um, if we always just counted back um, you know five positions from the head of our particle well when we first begin we're only on LED zero and we would try to light up the minus fourth LED or something like that that's going to create a horrible um, kind of try to access code that doesn't exist and things like that. So we need to do a couple of sanity checks first. Uh, we need to make sure that whatever position we are trying to light up uh, is positive value, for example, and also uh, lies within the range of the number of LEDs on the track. We don't want to, to try to go beyond that either. So we'll do that. And we also want to make sure that we don't try to light up the buffer zone at the end because those are values that... Uh, don't actually have LEDs assigned to them. They're, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of used to let us know that we've got to the end of the track. So we constrain the value we get 
uh, we make sure it's greater than zero and also less than the total number of LEDs. We'll look up that value in our array to see what um, position on the LED strip it corresponds to. And so long as that is not in the buffer zone, uh, we will light it up by the value that we uh, calculated up here. Phew! There you go. That is uh, sub sub pixel uh, brightness attempted to be explained. And we are so nearly there. Okay. Uh, this is nice and easy. So what we do now, let's work out the score. So our total score is zero. Uh, we'll loop over each of the tracks and we will um, add on to any LEDs at the bottom. So this score LEDs array, that was the one that defined uh, what the LEDs were going to light up according to the score. That's up here. Uh, so what we'll do is we will light up however many LEDs from that array there are equal to the score. So somewhere between zero and three of those LEDs will be lit up uh, with the corresponding color uh, of this track. If we have um, five tracks and each one of them can have a maximum score of three, so uh, if the total score, which we've added up on each line here, is equal to 15, that means that all tracks are complete. And that means we can call our onSolve method, which we defined earlier. And finally, uh, up to now, all this, <laughs> all this we've been doing up here, uh, all this moving of particles, all of them advancing down the, the uh, track and swapping lanes and things like that, all this we've been doing is actually updating this uh, LEDs array what we now actually need to do is to send that array to the strip so that it uh, actually reflects the underlying values that we've changed so that's what the show method does and we'll just call a little bit of a delay that's uh, we'll set kind of a frame rate um, just to keep it um, sort of operating at a, at a modest frame rate so um, I think 50, so you do a thousand divided by the desired frame rate will give that. So this would be 50 frames a second, which is still, um, you know, pretty silky smooth movement. I could probably introduce an even bigger delay than that, to be honest, um, and it would look just fine. So there we go. That is all the code. Uh, congratulations for making it that far with me. So a final couple of points to note. Obviously I've kept the theming of this puzzle relatively abstract because what I really wanted to do was concentrate on demonstrating the tech to you. So um, I've used just these kind of elemental symbols which I think people will associate with uh, particular colours or at least they hope they do. But it's never a good idea to have a puzzle that absolutely depends on the ability to distinguish colours because you have accessibility issues with colourblind players, for example. So I'll just point out that each of my particles is also of a different length um, corresponding to the colours as well. So my reds are just a single LED wide uh, because they are the first one on the left here. Uh, my blue ones, these are four wide, this is the fourth one in. Um, this actually gives players a clue as to the correct ordering as well because it's one, two, three, four, five. But most importantly, it gives an ability to distinguish between particle types, even for those that might be colorblind. Um, but you could theme this around uh, many other different, so for example, these LEDs might represent trains on a train track. They might represent uh, data transmissions in a computer network or many other things. Um, I think there are different themes that you could integrate this kind of puzzle into. Um, there's also different ways you could customise it. So, for example, uh, instead of having a toggle switch between two sections of track, you could use a rotary switch which uh, had three or, or more different paths which you could direct LEDs onto for the next one. And you could alter the wind conditions at the bottom as well. So rather than just having uh, three LEDs, you could have just a single one or you could have multiple ones, however you want to do. I hope that that give, has given you some ideas and a framework on which you can uh, develop a puzzle like that yourself then. If you have any uh, questions or comments, do uh, please write them below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Uh, as always, the downloadable source code and the wiring diagram and any other resources that go with this project, I will put up on my Patreon page for people to download. 
if you are able and if you would like to support me over there, then do please um, check them out. I'm very, very grateful for the support of all my Patreon donors who uh, allow me to continue making tutorials like this. Um, and if you have any suggestions for future tutorials for escape room tech puzzles which you'd like to see, um, do please let me know. And um, I'm always looking for ideas of, of future puzzles to do, so I'd love to hear from you. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll just say thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.